Hi everyone, we are talking about bear and zor sums now and this problem has been suggested by Arpit Agarwal so uh, it's a problem from the April courtship challenge, the recent one, the short one and the accuracy rate for this was pretty terrible, it had about 1% 1, 1 accuracy uh, around 7 people had actually solved this problem so let's talk about this you have this array, so the, the, the definition of the problem is very simple, you have an array of size n and all you need to do is find for every subarray the sum of that subarray and finally take the zor of all subarray sums so every subarray meaning that from any starting and ending index you have a contiguous subarray right so that would be from any i to j where i is less than or equal to j less than or equal to n and this is less than or equal to 1 so this these tuples can be formed using 1, 1, 1, 2 and so on and so forth for 1 up to 1, n and so you see that will be you know the last tuple will have just 1 the last index, starting index will have just 1 so there's n into n plus 1 possible subarrays that you can have using this array of size n so this is pretty big so if you use the brute force approach of finding out all subarrays and the sums of those subarrays it's going to take you order n square complexity. That's what we are fighting against. Now, one of the things that might happen is because you want the zor of all these sums, yeah, zor of all sums between i to j, where you know i and j belong, have this relation. So, looking at this, you might feel like okay. What I could do is I could pick up each element, find out how many times they occur in the sum, in the total sum of all these subarray sums. What I mean by that is how many times does zero occur in all the possible subarrays? Zero occurs index zero. So this is one-based indexing. We are taking zero-based indexing. Zero occurs in this subarray. It also occurs in this subarray. It occurs in this subarray of size three. So it's the starting index of this subarray also and so on and so forth up to n subarrays so it occurs n times right what about this index how many times does it occur in all possible subarrays it occurs in the subarray from 0 to 1 okay that's 1 plus from 0 to 2 okay that's another one and so on and so forth up to n so that is equal to n minus this subarray 0 to 0 so that is n minus 1 into what else well the subarray could be starting from 1 also and you would be having n minus 1 subarrays over there also so that would be n minus 1 so this is 2 into n minus 1 subarrays in total for the second index index 1 index 2 can occur with 0 starting up to 2 or up to 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 so Taking those into consideration, we have n minus 2. This, there's a plus here. So n minus 2 and plus all indexes starting from 1 and at least going up to 2. So that is n minus 1 plus all indexes starting from 2 and going up to n. So that is uh, n minus 2. I'm sorry, all. All of these, yeah, so that is n minus 2 again because from index 1 also you need to go to 2 and the remaining ones are just n minus 2, right? After 2, n minus 2 numbers remain and you need to at least go up to 2, so that is n minus 2 over here. So these are the ones with 0, 1, and 2 as starting indexes, right? And those are the only subarrays that you need to take care of. So this turns out to be 3 into n minus 2 for the second index. So you see a pattern here. The first one had 1 into n as a number of occurrences in all subarrays. The second one had 2 into n minus 1. The third one has 3 into n minus 2. So at index i, 1 plus i. So 0 gives us 1 plus 0. So that's what we are trying to do here. Uh, n minus i will give you for index 0 n minus 0 which will be n. So does this satisfy? Yeah. Index 1 is 2 and n minus 1 is 
n minus 1. So this is the series that we have. And for all indexes, you can find out the number of occurrences it has in all subarrays that it contributes to. So what you will get is for every index, you can calculate this very fast. And you can also calculate the value at that. So a of i into, let's call this uh, number of occurrences of that f of i. So f of i for all i. This will give you it's uh, the total contribution of all elements in the final sum. So in the total sum actually. So that will be the total sum. Okay, the total sum of all sub i to j. And then you might think, okay, why don't I just zor this? Why don't I just take the zor of this right here, and I'll get the final answer. This is wrong. And I initially made that assumption too. When I saw the question, I just thought, okay, I could do this, I could do this, and no, it doesn't work. The thing is, when you're taking zor of the total sum, that is different from taking the zor of all individual sums. Because if you if you have the individual sums as let's say uh, six, four, and two, the zor comes out to be zero, but the total sum here is twelve, and the zor of that is nothing. I mean, it's just twelve again. Okay. Of course, you could also think of why don't I just zor all the possible elements here? But that also doesn't make any sense because this is not the individual sums. It's the contribution of each element taken individually for all sub arrays that it contributes to. Okay, that, that's very different from the individual sums. So this approach does not work and let's try the correct approach now. One of the things that is very difficult in these questions is uh, thinking in terms of binary bits. So you have the given array, you are asked to take out the ZOR and ZOR is, you know, it, it's intrinsically binary. So it's better to think in terms of finding the final answer as binary bits. Right, that's, that's one of the very important things that you need to keep in mind if you're tackling this kind of problem. The second thing is you are going for sums, right? You're going for uh, a sum in a range from i to j. In those places, I, I wouldn't say this always happens, but there is some sort of dynamic programming or range query data structure which you end up with more often than not. Okay, here is your array. You're going to be using some sort of subarray sum so let's understand what we mean by that. That means that looking at the final sum, keeping in mind the final sum that we are going for, what are the observations we can make? Let's try to find all the binary bits of the final sum because that's constrained usually by 64 bits. So uh, finding out the bits of the binary sum is pretty efficient. So uh, we have the final sum. This is the answer actually. So ZOR of sums ij is going to be the answer and how's the answer going to look like thinking in terms of binary we have the bth bit of i set if and only if all the sums that you need to take all the sums of the sub arrays that you're taking if there be bth bits in total are odd Okay, so you have all the sums given to you. You have them laid out to you, let's say uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Ah, 0 is also fine. Ah, no, I think this guy is getting too lonely. So the ZOR of this is set because if you had three sub arrays, then the number of ones in this bit, this column is odd. So it would be 1. Here it would be even. Odd again. Even even because there are no, no ones here. So that's an important observation to make. What else can you say? Well, yes, if it is odd or even, you could, you could make the decision of whether this bit is set or not. But what if someone gives you the count of the bits that you have, which are set? Is that enough information? Yes, it is. What if someone gives you the information that the, the count of the bits which are not set? Is that enough information? Right? How many zeros you have in that column? Is that enough information for you? Yes, it is. Because we have n into n plus 1 by 2 as the number of sub arrays that we can have. 
And if someone gives you that, okay, these many bits are not set, let's say X bits are not set, then you can just take the bits which are set as this number. And if someone gives you the number of bits which are set as X, then that's great too. You can use these. What we are going to do is we are going to find out the number of bits which are set at any given column, at any given bit index, right? For all the possible sums, all possible subarray sums. So that's our strategy. For that, we need a few observations. Let's see what. One very common technique to find out range sums from for a subarray i to j is to use prefix sums. Right? Prefix sums are nothing but you, you take elements from the start and you go on adding the sum such that what you essentially have left at any given index is the total sum from the starting index to that index. So let's say uh, you can look at this array. It's giving you at index 0, 12, which is the value here. At index 1, you have value 20, which is 12 plus 8. At index 2, you have 29, which is 12 plus 8 plus 9. 29, yeah. So, so on and so forth. Of course, you can do this in a single pass. While you are going ahead, you use the previous sum calculated and you add the current index sum. So 29 plus 16 is going to give you 45 and so on and so forth. Easy stuff. What we need to do is create this prefix array and then make our observations. So now if we need to find out the sum of a subarray from i to j, all we need to do is take the sum up to j, which is this capital S minus S of i minus 1. It's a pretty common technique. You're taking all elements, the sum of all elements up to j. You're subtracting all the elements before that, before i. And so you have the sum given to you. What's our goal first of all? We have an answer, which will be the final answer over here. You need to find if it's bit is set or not, if all the bits, but for each bit you need to find out if it's set or not set. And to do that, we said that we need to find either the number of bits which are set are odd or even. Or the second thing you can do is find out the count of the bits which are set in that column for this answer. So what we are going to do is we are going to find out the count of the bits. So now we have simplified the problem. Because if you can find out at index B whether the bit is set or not in the final answer, then you can do that for all the bits in the answer and find the final answer. right? So we are just talking about finding out at a particular index B, whether the bit is set or not in the final answer. And you can do that for all bits. 64 or lesser actually, it will be 32. The constraints are really small. Let's get to it. So the technique we are using to solve this problem is to find for any S of i, the set of S of j's, okay, such that if you take the sum of the subarray i to j, you have the bth bit set. Okay, that's what you want. In turn, this means sum of the subarray from i to j. That means that you need the sum for up to i minus sum. In fact, sorry, this is sum up to j and sum up to i minus 1. This is what you want. And you need to find if the bth bit in that is set or not set. Okay. Doing this for all indexes is of course not possible. That's an n squared operation. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to constrain the number of values that j can take, s of j can take. We are trying to find out ranges for which s of j can fall into. And so what we are trying to do is we are trying to find some sort of relation between the sum j can have for any given sum i. Okay, so for that, we need to find a relation in binary that we can use. Let's see what that is. Important to notice here is that if you say that the bth bit is set in a binary number, the bth bit, which means a of b is set, which is 1. So that would mean that a is greater than or equal to 2 raised to the power b. This is also important in a different way because if I remove all the bits from B, so this is your binary number and who knows what exists here. It could be zeros or ones. And who knows what exists here also before it. So it could be greater than 2 raised to the power B of course. If I just chop off all these bits and convert them to zero, 
okay lots of zeros now and you have one here and then you don't know what exists here this is just the previous number that you had this is still guaranteed so a an operation on a still guarantees that you are greater than 2 raised to power b because setting these has not affected the 2 raised to power b bit and these can only contribute you know positive values to your to your original a so this is still greater than that so this operation of setting all the bits from a particular bit to the msb to zero is basically taking the and okay the binary and with a particular number so this is one that is uh, a and 2 raised to power b plus 1 minus 1 is what you're doing all right this is just some binary manipulation that you're doing so that you set all the bits over here to zero uh, why does this work well 2 raised to power b plus 1 is the number shown here right the bits here are zero the bits here are zero the number zeros are fine so or are they nah they are i think there's another zero here yeah now it's fine so this is the number 2 raised to the power b plus 1 if you subtract it by 1 all numbers here become 1 so subtract it by 1 and all numbers here become 1 and we also know that if we and anything with 1 it's a number itself so you're anding all these x's these unknowns with 1 they'll be themselves so you just get back the same number here for this part and you also added with zeros here so those will give you zeros so this is the operation you're performing a and 2 raised to power b plus 1 minus 1 fine this in turn actually means taking the modulo of a with 2 raised to power b plus 1 and I'll let you figure that out why this is the case but uh, this is the case you, you you can take out either modulo with 64 this is one operation that you can perform or you can also do an AND operation with 63 it's a much faster operation for the computer so always do that okay so we just said that if the bth bit is set in A A is greater than or equal to 2 raised to power B so we have given A a range it can't play in the infinite sum area it now has a range amongst which you can play on the other hand what that means is that if you have s of j minus s of i minus 1 which is basically a sub array sum from i to j its bth bit will only be set if its modulo with 2 raised to the power b plus 1 is greater than or equal to 2 raised to the power b why is this because you have removed all bits including b plus 1 all, all bits up to the msb from b plus 1 so the maximum bit which could be set is 2 raised to the power b now we just made the constraint that yes that bit is set so of course it's greater than or equal to 2 raised to the power b all right uh, that's that's what this is saying if the bth bit is set then after modulo with 2 raised to power b plus 1 it will definitely be greater than or equal to 2 raised to power b like we said in the in the observation okay what does that mean it means that if we take the sum up to j such that all the sums up to this point have been modulo with b plus 1 okay 2 raised to power b plus 1 modulo with 2 raised to power b plus 1 till this point you are going to represent that with b plus 1 minus the sum up to i with all the sums till this point being modulo with b plus 1 mod 2 raised to power b plus 1 greater than equal to 2 raised to power b this still makes sense because all the sums have been constrained by b plus 1 you are going on removing all msbs whenever you are calculating the sums right? so this is s of any i b is equal to s of 
i minus 1 comma b plus a of i modulo 2 raised to the power b plus 1. I'm sorry, 2 raised to the power b. Yeah. So this is what you have as the formula to calculate this. So all you need to do is a linear scan for any index i equal to 0 to n minus 1. And for all bits, you need to find out the respective sums that they're coming up with if you are going on removing the bits from b to the nsp. Okay, this is a simple way that you can cal calculate these uh, two terms. So there are only two possible scenarios you can have here. One is that this term, sum up to j, when you're ignoring bits from b plus 1 to msb, is greater than sum up to i for the same scenario. Okay, so if that is the case, then you have this s of j comma b plus 1 is greater than s of i comma b plus 1. Or s of j comma b plus 1 is less than s of i comma b plus 1. Or you could have them equal. Yeah. s of i comma b plus 1. If they're equal, if these two are equal, what is the sum here? It's 0. But what's the evaluation here? It's 0, right? 0 mod with whatever is 0. Is that greater than or equal to 2 raised to power b? No. Why did that ever happen? Because we just forced, we just said that definitely the bth bit is set. If the bth bit is set, these two sums cannot be equal. So this condition will never occur. So we can get rid of that. There are only two possible conditions we can, uh, which can occur. That is these two, whether they're greater or lesser. So let's take them. Now taking the first case into account, if s of j for a particular bit is greater than s of i for that particular bit, it means that you have a quantity here which is greater than this quantity. So this is positive. Whatever comes out of this is positive. This is another thing though. Because you're going on removing all bits from b plus 1 to msb, it means that this number is definitely smaller than 2 raised to the power b plus 1. All right. You can again prove that using the binary bits, like if you have if you have lots of bits here set, and you remove all bits from this point to this point, definitely that is smaller than one zero 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 because this bit is greater than all of these bits combined. Its contribution is greater than all of these bits combined. So, so this is less than two raised to the power b plus one. This is less than two raised to the power b plus one. A positive sum is coming out of them. They're definitely smaller than two raised to the power b plus one. So we have uh, s of j plus this quantity minus s of i comma b plus 1, this quantity is less than, strictly less than 2 raised to the power b plus 1. Okay, which gives you another relation s of j comma b plus 1 2 raised to the power b plus 1 minus, I'll get rid of this some space. No, it's not minus, it's plus. This, this quantity comes here. S of i comma b plus 1. All right, that's one relation that we have. Uh, the second relation is that the second relation is that this is actually greater than uh, 2 raised to the power b, like we said, greater than or equal to. So s of j comma b plus 1 is greater than or equal to 2 raised to the power b and we are shifting that plus s of i comma b plus 1. This is just using this relation over here. Right, so we have these two relations. If this condition satisfies, if j has a greater sum than up to i, all right, uh, we can actually squeeze these two relations in and say that s of 2 raised to the power b plus s of i comma b plus 1 is less than or equal to s of j up to b plus 1. And that in turn is lesser than or equal to s of i b plus 1 plus 2 raised to the power 
p plus 1. In fact, this is, this is not true. Okay, right. So this is the first condition that we have in case you have this scenario. What's the second scenario? The second condition occurs when you have the sum up to j and the sum up to i for a particular binary index b uh, and sum up to j is less than sum up to i. So can this ever happen? The answer is no because you know i is less than or equal to j and this is less than or equal to n and this is greater than or equal to 1 in a 1 based index array. I'll just take it a 0 based index array. And because all the elements are positive, you can guarantee that if you're taking a smaller index, that sum has to be less than or equal to the sum up to the greater index. So this condition can never occur. It can. It can. There's a small problem when you're taking all these Zor and binary sums. Uh, what you're doing is you're getting rid of all elements, or all the binary uh, bits from a particular index B to MSP. So what's going to happen is that you will have a sum, let's say, 1 billion approx, okay? So that would be 2 raised to power 31. This is huge. What if you have another number which is 1? Now your ith index is 3. So you take, you get rid of all elements from index 3, by index 3 to the MSB, which is let's say 64. So you get rid of all those indexes, you have just 0, 0, 0 remaining here, and you have 1 remaining here. This number is greater than this number, and our assumption was wrong. So this can actually happen. This can. So we need to take that into consideration. So what do we come up with? Take this term, S of J, P plus 1, minus, this is what we want, right? S of I, P plus 1. What is this term equal to? What is the sum equal to? S of i b plus 1, which means you're going on modding it with 2 raised to the power b plus 1, which means it can never exceed 2 raised to the power b plus 1. So this number is as big as 2 raised to the power b plus 1 minus 1 at its maximum capacity, you know, in its peak it's, it's reaching this number, 2 raised to the power b minus 1, because it never reaches 2 raised to the power b. We ensure that using these mod operations. What about this number? What is the minimum value it can take? Zero, yeah, zero, terrible. So you are doing this operation, which gives you, so this is in brackets, uh, this gives you one minus two raised to the power b plus one. Okay, so this is the minimum value that you can get from this equation. In turn, that means that if you add two raised to the power b plus one to this, let's do that, let's add two raised to the power b plus one to this which in turn means like you're adding 2 raised to the power b plus 1 to this. These two terms get cancelled out. You have 1, which is greater than 0. Alright, so this term now is definitely greater than 0. Alright. Take your time to get through the math, but this is now true. We just added a particular power of 2 and made sure that this is greater than 0. That in turn means that s of j b plus 1 is greater than 2 raised to the power b plus 1 I'm sorry, uh, is greater than s of i b plus 1 minus 2 raised to the power b plus 1 This is what the guarantee is now because we just shifted terms Also s of j comma b plus 1 is less than s of i b plus 1. That's a relation over here. Okay, this is the first relation that we are taking and this is a second relation that we got from this term. Okay. Yeah, this is the second relation. So, uh, what do we come up with? We can squeeze in the value of s of j over here also. That is s of j b plus 1 is less than this value, so it's less than s of i b plus 1, and it's greater than this value, so it's greater than s of i b plus 1 
minus 2 raised to the power b plus 1. Okay. So we have this equation, which is one of our equations. Uh, the other equation is this equation, which is a pretty big equation again, but let's compare these two. Looking at these two ranges, you can say that the rightmost value here, the greatest value that this range can take, is smaller than the smallest value that this range can take. Because you have s of i comma b plus 1 here, and you have s of i comma b plus 1 plus 2 raised to power b here. So these two ranges have no intersection, right? There's null set, null values are intersected. Uh, and essentially, you can say that if for any i you find out the range of sums which any other j can satisfy, then you can answer this question. This is the point where you have solved the problem. Because if you can find s of i's in this range and s of i's in this range, then you have found out all s of j's which were even possible uh, when you need to have the bth bit set. So to find out the number of bth bits which are set, you need to find out the number of s of i's which fall in either of these two ranges for any bit b. Okay, that's, that's the main core of the problem. And to do these uh, computations, you need some sort of range queries that you need to make. Okay, uh, to find out i for a particular bit, you need to have a range query data structure. And in this case, you need a segment tree. So you need b segment trees to find out for any given bit b, what are the number of sums, sums up to i, which fall in this range. Now the thing is, of course, uh, if you do this in a brute force way, you will need i is going from 0 to n, right? Uh, you will need b bits for every bth bit. So b bits is somewhere around 32. Uh, into, because you're doing a brute force way, uh, you have to go from i to j. And this sum is around order n square b. So that's pretty bad. Uh, of course, you can improve on this. You can use a range query data structure. So this part has been quite long. In fact, I have run out of time now. So uh, we'll be talking about a segmentary approach next time. There's a lot to absorb in this one. So if you have any doubts or comments, please leave them below. I'll be sharing the problem description and relevant code once I'm done with the second part in the link below. Okay, so best of luck for the next contest.